I have seen enough. We are not finished, Eivor. This saga we have written together, it needs an ending. Here and now. It is ended, Eivor. I'm done with this place. A fight to the death. You and me. If I win, I am the greatest Vikinger who ever lived. If I lose, what a tale you have to tell. So the Northman is coming out in cinema soon. I think some people have already gone to see it. So it started up like a conversation about the role of, I guess, Viking culture in elements of the far right. And of course, this is nothing new. I've actually covered some of this on the channel itself when I've talked about Anglo-Saxons. I also spoke about paganism and stuff like that. But today, just because it's on topic, I wanted to talk about Vikings specifically. Now, Viking culture and Viking history is something I've really gotten into over the last two or three years. A lot of you will probably be the same because of things like God of War or The Last Kingdom or Vikings The Show. Or for me personally, a big one was Assassin's Creed Valhalla. For this first part of this video, I do want to talk about my own experience of this stuff. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get into the recent kind of controversy with the Northmen and how it depicts that era. Then I want to go into why the right wing love this culture and love this era and how it's pretty much based on a revisionist history of the time, something that paints this Scandinavian culture as something that it really, really wasn't. And this is even matched by like DNA evidence into, I guess, the ethnic and racial makeup of certain Viking groups as well. And then I want to talk about how the Germans in the 1930s appropriated this kind of culture because, of course, there is a cultural link between Germans and Scandinavians in that they essentially both believed in the same pagan gods. The Germans just had their own version of them, just kind of like how the Greeks and Romans believed in the same gods. They just, you know, different versions. And because I'm reading a book about medieval history, it is a very fitting topic for me. So before we go any further, people often say I have to remind you, but please like the video if you want to support the video and maybe leave a comment. For today's video, I guess I will ask people in the comments what is something that introduced you to Viking culture and do you find Viking history and culture appealing generally? Let me know down in the comments. If you want to support my work financially, please consider becoming a patron. I want to build up as many $1 to $3 patrons as possible and the benefits of that are getting my Nintendo Switch friend code and getting access to the private patrons Discord server. Also check out my second channel, The Cabernacle Extra, where I archive my live streams and come join my community in my Reddit. All of this stuff is in the description. I know it's like a real minority of you. There are timestamps in every single one of my videos. They are labeled. If you don't want to hear me talk about like my own experience with Viking culture in today's video, for example, you can then skip to the Northman part because that will be in the timestamps. It is a bit frustrating doing longer form videos and constantly getting comments about me to like get to the point when I have timestamps so you can just pick and choose what parts of the video you watch, don't have to watch it all. But with that out of the way, to start with, I'm gonna talk about my personal experience and perception of Viking culture. So like I said, I pretty much got into it recently and that's thanks to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Why I played God of War and that made me, I guess, more aware of the Norse pantheon of gods, so did the Marvel movies. I didn't really like God of War too much, like I said before, but seven out of 10. I honestly found the game like a bit bloated, to be honest. But with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I like the more historical take on it. And it even has this mode called Discovery Mode, where it basically takes you through like kind of like a guided tour of the era. And the best part for me was when you go to Jorvik and you learn so much about the crossover between Viking and Christian culture in that a lot of Christians often accepted some of the Norse gods like Thor, while a lot of Vikings, although they didn't convert to Christianity wholesale, they often accepted Jesus Christ into their pantheon of gods. And you can see this I guess in their jewelry and things like that. But Viking culture as a whole didn't write anything down. And the Scandinavians who did write down most of their history were actually Christian Scandinavians in like the 1100s. So it is really, really hard to ascertain what is fact and fiction when it comes to historical figures and characters like Ragnar, the star of Vikings. Well, he's believed to be like a mashup of many different historical figures and they often do not know 
what he did or what various other historical figures did, including a lot of his sons. And either the boneless being like one of the most famous ones who did exist, and I only really know that because in my history degree, we did a lot about King Alfred the Great and his Bible and the written works of the time, and either the boneless came up a lot. But something I find quite appealing about Viking culture, I guess, I like the predeterminism bit of it, and I know certain Christian groups do believe this as well. I'm Catholic, so I was never taught that predeterminism was a thing. But also, I think the Norse pantheon of gods, like many pantheons of gods, is actually really, really interesting in terms of the stories because not every god is a good person. Odin is not necessarily a good person, just like the Greek gods and Roman gods. Whereas when you grow up in a religion like Christianity, you're taught that you know, Jesus Christ was the most you know moral person who ever existed. All these saintly figures, you could never ever be like them. And it just becomes a bit boring. I know Old Testament God is a lot more evil, but again, I find it a bit boring, especially because I was raised in it. But the history is fascinating in terms of the Vikings conquering loads of parts of England and how the cultures mesh together. And also things like how they explored North America, which is totally insane. You can read accounts of them fighting Native Americans. It's just like something I never really knew about until you actually go to Vinland in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And that's why I like that game so much. I know a lot of you guys meme me because I like Assassin's Creed games. I like them because they're massive budget open world history games. And as someone, you know, got background with my history degree and I just love this history, that is like a dream come true for me. So I've been getting into it so much so that my little brother actually bought me like one of these like legit horns that Vikings alleged to have you know drunk out of you see it in the shows you see it in the games and also i guess like we'll put it on the orange part i guess a lot of the cultural things in terms of the music and the songs from the time which have gained popularity thanks to things like assassin's creed and enar selvik who is this icelandic pagan musician who's become popular through assassin's creed and vikings i guess there's just a lot of things to like about even the role of women in their society in terms of they could divorce their husbands and stuff which you couldn't do in christian europe at this time so for me personally there's a lot to like about it and it's very very interesting and as like sailors the vikings were like very very accomplished and also one thing i would say a lot of people act like vikings were the most brutal warriors in the history of the world essentially but when you actually read about the history of medieval europe i don't really find too much that is unique to their brutality. If you read about like the Persians, the Roman Empire, you read about the Visigoths, you read about the Huns, you read about all these tribal groups in Europe, they pretty much all do the same thing. They sack, they pillage, they murder whole cities, they do all these things. Again, I do not find the Vikings that different. So I just wanted to give my perspective of someone who is like a left-wing, anti-capitalist, anti-racist, who does actually find Viking culture and history like very attractive. I can understand why it's become so popular thanks to all these TV shows, movies, and games because, again, I like it too, and the soundtrack in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, absolutely incredible, uses like Old Norse because Icelandic people speak Old Norse, and it feels very, very authentic, uses like really old instruments. But of course, when you have a culture that's mainly about like white Europeans who have, I guess, a history of conquest and also this warrior culture where a significant amount of them are going to go to Valhalla. And there's that great scene in Vikings where King Ekbert is talking to Ragnar and Ragnar makes fun of heaven saying, you know, where everyone is happy. And King Ekbert says, well, you want to go to a place where you wake up every day and you just start killing each other in Valhalla and you do that for eternity. I find that quite funny, but that's why it appeals to so many people on the far right. So just a Daily Mail article playing into this outrage. I don't really see too much of this, but I'm, sh I'm sure it's happening because the far right appropriate Viking culture all the time. Blockbuster starring Nicole Kidman features Nordic law, popular with right-wing groups who hail its all-white cast and pure masculinity. So, posts on Reddit and 4chan have been celebrating the film, with one 4chan user writing, Robert Eggers, he is restoring pride in our people with his great films. The North Man is going to be epic. Hail Odin, another person commented, North Man is a base movie, all-white cast, and shows pure, raw masculinity. And Robert Eggers has actually acknowledged how much these types like these movies anyway. So an interview with Forbes by Simon Thompson, Robert Eggers on The Northman and why he'd have been happier if it were harder to make. Thompson says, uh, is The Northman the kind of movie you wanted to tackle but couldn't or have always wanted to make but people would have not gone for it five or ten years ago? Eggers saying, 
For me, I think five or ten years ago, people would not have gone for it, but I was personally not interested in Vikings. I wasn't interested in them as a kid. I didn't like the macho stuff and the right-wing misappropriation of Viking culture cemented my disinterest as an adult. When I went to Iceland, the landscapes were so epic and brutal and awe-inspiring, but this is not a newsflash. However, experiencing it firsthand made me pick up Icelandic sagas, and then I became interested in Vikings. So I think that's like a lot of people. I went to Iceland when I was 17 on a school trip uh, for about three or four days. And it's absolutely amazing country, just absolutely beautiful. Also, fun fact, the first people to actually go to Iceland were Irish monks. And then the Scandinavian settlers came later. But just talking about this discourse a bit, there's an article I want to get into which accuses the film of not trying to distance itself from the right-wing appropriation. Um, but just this tweet by Brave Arcanine I found interesting. Uh, the Northman discourse, I think being wary of art because its imagery might attract um, white supremacists would hold more water if for the fact that My Little Pony also got a fan base like this. They're going to try and claim your stuff no matter what you really do. Like a lot of freaks, like the ones in my mentions will have American History X characters for their profile pic, a movie that very much not on their side, but they don't really care. So an article by Princess Weeks on the Mary Sue. So I just want to respond to this because it addresses this. The Northman aimed to reclaim Viking history. The Observer reports that at the movie's London premiere, Eggers expressed that in the film, he wanted to reclaim Viking history and Norse mythology from racists who have used them as symbols of um, bigotry. He later told them during an interview that those associations almost dissuaded him from tackling the project in the first place, that quote I read you earlier. It's very easy for the spectacle, the framing to undermine the message. If that is all people choose to see, especially since the film is filled with just white people and the lead couple is two blondes. The Guardian notes that Stormfront uh, made a thread of good nationalist films that fall under the following criteria. Positive portrayal of whites in defense against depredations of liberalism, crime, and attack by alien races. Positive portrayal of heterosexual relationships and sex and marriage. Portrayals of white males as intelligent, sensitive, and strong in positive leadership roles or romantic leads. Particularly intense portrayals of white female beauty in non-degrading ways. So not only does the Northman hit all of these marks, but so do films like Lord of the Rings and most Jane Austen adaptations. Not because all these works have inherent roots in racism, but because the criteria is so basic. Racists may not own Norse and Viking mythos history, but they've done a lot of work of incorporating it into their brand. However, they are helped along by academia and others continue to spread the illusion that Europe always was a white place. Dorothy Kim, an Asian American medieval literature lecturer at Brandeis University in Massachusetts, made the point that at this point, unless you make choices to actively distance yourself from the right wing's depictions of the medieval past, you may end up just upholding them anyway. Invoking the medieval past has now become a more generalized sign of the right. The point is not the specifics of the historical detail or what certain medieval things may mean to certain groups. Instead, the point is to gather them all for the maximum amount of attention. Egger's movie is still an overwhelmingly white and heterosexual depiction of the time period. It still has the potential to whet the appetites of those who want to weaponize the imagery. So just contrasting that tweet I read to the article, I think it makes an interesting point that these types of people, they do not need something like this to grab onto it. You see it with bronies or furries or even like right wing fans of Metal Gear Solid because of often the depiction of women and some of the combat and stuff. I made a whole video about how the Italian right appropriated Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit for their own political ends in the 1970s. These types will always do this type of thing. But with historical time periods like Ancient Sparta is another big one for these types and Scandinavian Vikings, it comes from a place of revisionist history. So on one end, I do actually understand what the article is saying. I don't think Eggers had to do this, but like I said, there were gay relationships in Viking culture, something you didn't get very common in Christian culture. There were women who could divorce their husbands. There were Vikings who traveled to Spain and they worked as like mercenaries for the Byzantine Empire. Some of them even converted to Islam and worked for the Arab empires. So 1917 is obviously a film set in World War One, but there were little things in that, like showing the colonial troops, for example, that's not very common in films. And people were saying it wasn't really realistic to show colonial troops mixing with loads of white troops. But I think the point of that was just to show you they were there. And when you have this one film where you're tackling this one conflict, maybe you can include that just to show that these things did happen. So I understand the criticism that if Eggers wanted to kind of like reclaim the history, 
then why don't you show maybe some Vikings who came back from Spain or came back from the Middle East and maybe they'd converted to Islam but they'd come home or something like that. And as you guys will know, if you read your medieval history, the notion that all European nations in medieval times were like white is pretty ridiculous. We had this discourse about the realism of Elden Ring when black creators wanted black hairstyles and they're saying that, well, there were no black people in medieval times, despite the fact that like Roman emperors who sat at Rome before the medieval times uh, were often black. There were plenty of North Africans who went to places like Spain. Most of Spain was owned by various Arab kingdoms and caliphs and stuff like that. The fact that people believe there were no non-white people in Europe is just basically a myth. But it's a very, very common myth and a lot of people do believe this. But like I said, to believe that Vikings are the embodiment of the white race, you basically have to read a lot of German propaganda from the early 1900s and obviously the 1930s to 40s period. And you also just have to not know your history that well. And think these people never assimilated to other cultures or embraced other cultures or embraced other cultures of people who weren't the same color skin as them. You have to remember racism as we understand it today did not exist in the 800s to 1100s period. So I think it's very, very important to realize for a lot of people that you grow up with this view of every different culture, especially in medieval times, being com completely intolerant of each other. You might read about the First Crusade and reading about the sacking of Jerusalem, and then in your mind you're like, well, that's how they probably reacted whenever they saw any Muslims, the Christians, but then you read about how the Venetians used to trade mostly with the Muslims and even with the Ottoman Empire, despite being allied primarily with the papacy and the empire of Spain. History is a lot more diverse than you're led to believe. And that's something to remember whenever you see people trying to claim elements of history for their own political ideology. So now I wanna go into the origins of this stuff. Like it seems pretty clear on the surface because of the Viking ruins, which of course were appropriated by the Germans. This thing has inherent appeal to the right wing because of the violence in Viking religion. Like you wanna get to Valhalla. If you wanna get to Valhalla, you don't die in your bed of old age. You've literally got to die in battle. And of course there are other parts of the afterlife of people who weren't soldiers, but this is like the glory that a lot of these people sought. So just how like the Germans idealized the Spartans from ancient Greece, they idealized this supposed Viking warrior culture. Or about that diversity of the actual Vikings, I found an interesting article on the University of Alberta. So Scandinavian studies professor Natalie van Doysen says historical records and DNA evidence show that the age of Nordic racial purity touted by racists never existed. So the most compelling evidence refuting racial purity is DNA analysis of skeletal remains from the Viking Age, which reveals a high degree of ethnic exchange. The extent to which people married and also took slaves or concubines from different places they went indicates it wasn't a pure Germanic monoculture. The Vikings traveled to what is now Newfoundland, she said, trading with people who were probably the ancestors of the Inuit. They also traveled to Islamic Spain and to Baghdad and to Constantinople. They were pretty much everywhere and they had peaceful relations and non-peaceful relations. A striking feature of the early Viking success was their ability to embrace and adapt from a wide range of cultures, whether that be the Christian Irish in the West or the Muslims or the Abbasid Caliphate in the East. So an article on time um, was really, really interesting to me. So despite the fact that real Viking history is multicultural, academic medieval studies have historically been to blame for upholding that of an imaginary past. In the 19th century, romantic German nationalism metastasized into the Volkish movement, which was interested in historical narratives that bolstered a white German state. The movement rewrote history, drawing on folklore, such as that of the Brothers Grimm, medieval epics and a dedication to racism, late 19th and early 20th century scholars simultaneously drew from and reinforced this racialized imagination of the medieval past. Crucially, Wilhelm Grombach's multi-volume work, The Cultures of the Tetons, imagined an ancient German genealogy that ran from Tacitus through the Middle Ages. German scholarly work during the eve of the Third Reich then added to this idea with authors like Gustav Neckel and Bernard Humer blaming socialism, Jews and the class revolutions for the decline of the Germanic race that they saw was descended from this Viking past. Another German scholar, Otto Hoffler, who based his work on Gronbach, wrote of the Manabon, which the scholar Stephanie von Schnurbein has described as an all-male warrior associations in so-called primitive society. After World War II, despite the defeat of the Axis powers, 
These ideas didn't go away. They saw a resurgence in specific circles, including right-wing neo-pagan groups like the Scandinavian Nordic resistance movements. So I'm just gonna show you some of the German propaganda in the 1930s and 40s, trying to get to the Norwegians and other Scandinavian groups to fight for them against the Allies, primarily the Soviet Union. So here you have the Nordman, and it has a German soldier, and it has an old Norse soldier, and then you have another one here. And it's basically a German soldier, but also with a, like a Viking get up on a Viking longship. And then you have another Viking longship in this imagery. And then you have another one talking about Bolshevism. And it's got what appears to be a Norwegian person shaking hands with a German soldier. Just to end the history part of this video, I want to read a bit of a paper from Lena Nyswander from Bowling Green State University, where it just talks about the German fetishization of Scandinavian culture. So rather than a celebration of Nordic heritage, German Nordicism aligns itself more solidly with the fetishization of those of Nordic descent. In this way, the fictional Nordic race was considered to be the superior branch of the Aryan race. Cynthia Miller Idris discusses the formation and spread of the myth of the Nordic descent in her book, Historical Fantasies. Here she acknowledges that while the origins of when exactly the link between the ideas of Aryanism and, and Nordicism began developing are unknown, she does give some context. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a growing number of anti-modern Germanic religious groups rooted in ancient Germanic and pagan mythology, along with Volkish political and youth movements, began to explicitly link Nordic, Aryan and Germanic groups into a blended form of nationalism and spirituality. Nordicism was to be seen as an organic extension of the growing vision of Aryan superiority in New Germany, but it might have had more sway in the development of ideas uh, seen in the country than one would expect. Such Volkish movements positioned the Aryan race as locked in an epic struggle with non-Germans and Semites who were forcing the nation away from its true Nordic natural roots. Only a regeneration of the German nation would offer possible salvation and an eventual future utopia. Also appealing to the Germans at the time was what they believed the relative racial purity of Scandinavian countries because they weren't at the center of Europe. They didn't have as many immigrants as a lot of these other countries and because they didn't have often and global spanning empires as large as like the British Empire, they often did not have the influence of colonies in Asia or Africa or the Middle East. But for a lot of these people, again, it's like a revisionist view of history that has become somewhat completely entrenched in our own culture and our own view of these things. And of course, for the Germans and for people like Hitler, he viewed a lot of Northern Europeans as part of the same race of people. Because if you know your history, you will know that after the Roman Empire just left Britain, it was primarily fought over by Irish raiders, Scottish Picts, and Romanized Celtic British people who eventually invited Saxons and Jutes and other Northern European groups to come over and fight for them but of course these people didn't leave, they stayed and then they'd conquered a lot of England before the Scandinavians also came over and conquered a lot of England. So what Hitler sees with the English especially is a shared Anglo-Saxon heritage in that England, Scandinavia and Germany have a sort of shared genealogy because they're all made up of the same groups of people historically. Of course it ignores a lot of history but I spoke about this a lot with the establishment of contemporary racism, racism as we understand it, what Americans, I guess, often don't understand is that because of the Anglo-Saxon thing really diminishing in America over the last 100 years, that the proper institution of white supremacy has Northern Europeans at the top of it. You gotta be Northern European, you gotta be Scandinavian, you gotta be pure German. If you're Spanish, if you're Italian, if you're Greek, if you're part of a country that has historically had ties to the Arab world, to Muslims and groups like that, then there's no way you can be a pure white person. Like even me, for example, I get a lot of racism on YouTube because I have dark features. I have basically brown, black hair, eyes, and a beard. So people say, well, you're not white, you're not Irish, how can you be? Like you must have some descendant in your background who came from the Mediterranean or something like that. And if they came from the Mediterranean, that means that you probably aren't actually white. You're not pure enough or that you are some sort of like Russian or Chechen or something like that. It's really, really bizarre. And while this way of thinking was so popular in America at the turn of the 20th century, it's really diminished as groups like the Irish and groups like Italians have come to be seen as white people, where in a lot of European countries, the right wing do not view this as the same thing. So I guess the point about the Northmen not tackling, I guess, the revisionist history in Viking studies 
is a legit point, I think, because like I said with 1917, you can at least show something that will at least have people reevaluate what they think Viking culture was like. But at the same time, that tweet made a good point saying they're going to adopt it anyway. They're going to appropriate it anyway. If there was an Arabic Viking in the Northmen, do you think they wouldn't appropriate it? They'd probably like it a bit less. But again, if you're showing like a white male power fantasy to a lot of these people, I think they're going to like it anyway. But like the article said, which I was reading, a lot of this belief is based in German scholarship from the 1930s and 40s and has been pushed even further by Western academia. But thankfully now people are looking at this differently and seeing that, yes, the Vikings had like trading outposts, settlements, all around the known world at the time a lot of them adopted cultural practices and took wives and had children who were not white who were not pagan often were christian or muslim or some sort of like orthodox christian and if you believe these people are some sort of like representative of your own right-wing ideology today you only have to read a bit of history to understand how ridiculous that is but again all these right-wing types need revisionist history or their whole narrative just gets destroyed. Anyway, let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Follow me on social media at The Cavernacle, on Twitter, on Instagram. Please support me on Patreon. Please subscribe to my channel to help me get a new chocolate orange. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.